We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, uh, I'll be, uh, let me say it again, happy? No, my wife's birthday. Happy birthday, Melissa. We'll, we'll arm wrestle later for who gets all the attention. You win. All right. Happy Father's Day to all the dads in the room. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, my name's Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor, and uh, we're, we're excitedly going through a series through the book of Ephesians. So grab your Bible, open up to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, where we're going to keep going on in this, this series together. Give you a little bit of a, uh, an interesting kind of thing. As you read through the book of Ephesians, you're going to notice that almost every chapter seems to have this concept of a mystery. Paul keeps talking about a mystery. I'm convinced that as Paul was writing this letter, that he had probably just maybe heard a great mystery uh, it, while he's sitting in prison. Maybe he read a good mystery novel or something. I don't know, but for some reason, the word mystery is on his mind as he's writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. And it just seems like every chapter you read it, and he's talking about some mystery. Well, in chapter 5, as you're turning there, if you don't have a Bible, by the way, just grab one of our Bibles and put your name in it, all right? It's right underneath the chair in front of you. Take that with you. Uh, we want you to have that. Uh, but in chapter 5, he talks about another mystery. And I'll show you the verse. It says in verses 31 and 32, it says, As the Scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And then it says this. This is a great mystery. But it is an illustration of the way that Christ and the church are one. So that's where we're going to really land today. We're going to talk about this mystery of marriage. Okay? The mystery of marriage. This supernatural oneness is where we're going to find ourselves. But if you look through chapter 5, you're going to notice that the part about marriage is actually the second half of chapter 5. And I'm pretty sure you all paid full admission today, right? So I'm going to give you the first part of chapter 5 real quick. And you can go home and you can study it a little bit more on your own. As we're going through the book of Ephesians together, I don't want to skip a portion. So I'm going to give you the first part of chapter 5 before we get into the mystery of marriage. And believe it or not, the first part is actually really necessary to understand the mystery of marriage. So they all are related, okay? So, uh, anyone in this room ever do uh, like competitive speech in high school? Speech or debate? I see one hand, a couple, a few of us. All right, well, anybody know? There, there's a type of competitive speech that I did in high school. I was on the speech and debate team. But I didn't debate. I wasn't a debater. I was on the more of the expository communicating side of things. And there was an event called impromptu. Impromptu speech. And what it was, and this is kind of crazy even thinking back to it. You would draw out of a hat three topics that you had never seen before. Draw them out. You'd get to pick one. As soon as you draw, drew the third one and you were looking at them, your timer started. You had seven minutes to take that topic that you've never seen before that moment and to write a speech and deliver a speech in seven minutes. And it's pretty crazy because most of the time, the way you would win is you just had to be very confident about a topic you knew very little about. You just had to come up with a speech. And, and so there's a format when you're writing a speech, right? If everyone, you're in speech class right now, you're welcome, all right? There's three main parts to a speech. The first part is simply put, to tell people what you're going to tell them. Hey, I'm going to tell you this today. Second part is tell them what you told them you were going to tell them. And then the third part is tell them what you just told them. Right? So repeat. 
and conclude and bring it all back together. So Paul is simply following this format. And when you look at the first verse of chapter 5, you're going to see that he lays out his introductory statement. He's, he's about to tell us what he's going to tell us in chapter 5. And here's what he says. He says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. You see, this verse right here is essentially the crux of the whole chapter. It's saying, hey, listen, followers of Christ, it, believers, not only in the church in Ephesus, but also at Arundel Christian Church, we are called to be imitators of Christ. We're called to, to reflect him, to look like him, to do our best to... to and now listen, when you see someone do an imitation of someone else, it, it, it's not going to be perfect, right? There's going to be a few things that are off. You're like, oh, you don't really quite look like him, or your ears are too big, or your, your, their voice is a little bit lower. But you can usually tell when someone's pretty good at imitating someone who it is that they are imitating, right? You can figure it out. And the truth is, none of us in this room are going to be able to perfectly imitate God. Sorry. You're just not going to be able to do it. But you certainly have been asked in Scripture to try. You should be able to do it so, clo so well that people could look at you and see God in you. To see that you're imitating, you're trying your best to imitate God. And so Paul says that we're supposed to imitate God, and he talks about how to do that. So I'm going to give these to you quickly because I want to get to the mystery of marriage. All right, so if you want to be an imitator of God, the first thing it says in verse 2 is you have to imitate God's love for others. One of the things that we're called to do is to imitate his love for others. It says in verse 2, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He's going to love, and then we're going to love the way he loves. It says he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So if you want to love and you want to imitate God, you're going to love other people the way God loves them. You're probably going to get it really, really off. Where There's no way you're going to be able to love people the way God loves people. But you should imitate it. You should learn how to do it so well that people can see God's love in you. All right, here's the second thing. Paul says to the church in Ephesus and to the church at Arundel Christian Church, he says, imitate God's purity. If you want to be an imitator of God, we see in verse 3, it says, Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. So if, again, if you want other people to see God in you, we recognize that God is perfectly holy. He is perfectly righteous. Now, listen, we all know that no one in this room meets the, that criteria, right? None of us are perfectly holy or righteous. But we should do our best to imitate God to try to make wise decisions, to think pure thoughts, to uh, essentially to stay away from sexual immorality, to stay away from greed, these things that, that make us not look nothing like God. We want to instead choose purity. All right, here's the third thing. If we want to imitate God, we're going to imitate God's light. We see this in verses 6 through 14. Now, because I'm only reading a few verses for you, Make sure you go home and read the first part of chapter 5. We're going to go through the rest of it together today. But here, here's an idea of that. In Ephesians 5 verse 8, it says, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. I want you to understand this. The Bible says that God is light. He is light. And you and I, when we make a decision to be followers of Jesus, we want to be imitators of him. The best way to do that is to think of yourself like a mirror. You know when you see like light coming from through a window and you can take your cell phone and try to like bounce it in, in someone's eyes? Have you ever done that before? Or do I just annoy my family? Am I the only one? All right, we're called to be like a mirror that as God is perfect light and we want to be imitators of him, we, of him, we want people to see God in us, we get the opportunity to reflect his light into the world around us, All right? So we want to imitate him. We want people to see his light in us, and we have the Holy Spirit living in us, that, and we know that God is light. And it says in verse 11, it says, take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. In other words, 
Don't participate in being a part of the problem, but instead be the light that shines light into that darkness and exposes it. So if you want to be an imitator of God, right, we're going to love others the way God loves them. We're going to seek to be pure the way God is pure. We're going to be God's light in this world. Number four, to be an imitator of God, we're going to imitate God's wisdom. We're going to do our best to to be wise and make wise decisions using the Holy Spirit's guidance inside of us. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. When I say we, by the way, I'm talking about those of you in this room who have made a decision to follow Jesus. You have that access to that kind of wisdom and power inside of you, and we're called to imitate that wisdom. It says in verse 15, it says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. And then the fifth one, the fifth way to imitate God, it starts with this verse in Ephesians 5, verse 21. It says, And further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And here's the fifth one. You guys have it already written out in your notes, but it says, Imitate God's relationship with his church. Now, I don't know about you, when I look at this list, the first four make sense to me. If we put that, that list of all five up on the screen real quick. The first four make sense to me. Uh, they, I understand the, God's love for others, God's purity, imitate God's light, imitate God's wisdom. But when this fifth one shows up, I'm like, what does that mean? To imitate God's relationship with his church. What is that about? And this is actually like kind of that transition into this concept of the mystery of marriage. There's something beautiful about marriage where God has created it in such a way where we have the opportunity to imitate the relationship that God has with the church and that the church has with God. Something really powerful here. Now remember in, in, when you're giving a speech, so Paul gave his opening statement, right? He says, everybody listen, I want you to be imitators of God. And then he gives these five points, right? You need to love people. You need to be pure like God is pure, right? You need to uh, imitate God's light. You need to imitate God's wisdom. And then he gives this last one, imitate God's relationship with his church. And one of the things you're going to notice when you're giving a speech and you have like three points or four points or five points like Paul does, you're usually going to spend more time on a point that's more important. Or if, you, if it's going to take more time to explain or it's harder to understand, you might spend more time on that point. And what we see is the whole second half of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is focusing on this point, right? That we are, uh, that, that we are called to imitate God's relationship with his church. Now, one of the things I want you to understand when we talk about this and how it relates to the mystery of marriage, how marriage is the tool that we have to imitate God's relationship with his church. We understand there's, there's kind of an interesting reoccurring thing that happens in God's word. You're going to notice as you get familiar with this book that there's often times that the analogy of a wedding is used to describe God's relationship to his believers. You'll notice that, that believers are often called the bride of Christ, that we all, and those of you in this room, whether you're male or female, uh, we're, we play the part of the bride, and God, uh, Jesus plays the part of the groom, right? There's, there's actually a really powerful example of this in Revelation chapter 19. We actually see that once all the people have been gathered back to God in heaven, there's going to be this incredible feast, and all believers are going to be present, and it's called uh, basically the, the great wedding feast of the Lamb. And the bride of Christ, which is the church, those of us in this room that are believers, and, and God, the groom, will be kind of reunited in this great wedding feast that brings the, our, our parties back into, I mean, we're sitting there in now perfect relationship with God the Father for eternity. So what I want you to understand is that when you talk about the Bible and how there's God or Jesus playing the role of the groom, 
and the church playing the part of the bride, that there's two very, there, there's two parts to play in this analogy, right? Someone, you have Jesus, and you have the church. And so when we look at the, the mystery of marriage, we're trying to really understand how does a marriage reflect Jesus and the church. And so that's what we're going to talk about together. Before I do, I, I want to give you some, some good news that's going to get you scratching your head for a minute. We just replenished all of our first aid kits around the church with some special uh, toe-shaped band-aids. <laughs> because today is one of those days where I'm going to say some things. I don't really have to worry about the words that come out of my mouth. Because I'm going to say things that come out of this book, and I'm not going to apologize for them, but I can tell you they're going to be uncomfortable to hear for many people. The world teaches on this subject a certain way, and it is so different than the way God's Word teaches about this mystery of marriage that for some people, especially if you're in this room and maybe you have not yet made a decision to follow Jesus, the things I'm going to say might make you really uncomfortable. And that's what those band-aids are for if I step on your toes today. All right. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to get into the mystery of marriage. God, thank you so much for this, this morning that we have together. Thank you for the Word of God. We know that when we go into it, it is a source of truth. It is a source of wisdom. It will always guide us to the right decisions. Help us to be able to look at your Word as, well, for what it is that we don't need to wonder whether or not we like certain things in it, whether or not it, it meshes with our perspective, because we know that your perspective is better than ours. Help us to have softened hearts to hear how we can improve our relationships, not only with you as a church, but our relationships within marriage. And we give this time of teaching to you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Here's the first point. If you're filling in the blank today, the mystery of marriage, according to Ephesians chapter 5, in other words, according to God, is number one, wives are called to reflect the role of the church. Remember, we have two parts that are going to be played in this. If, if a marriage is meant to reflect the relationship that Jesus has with his church, what Paul's about to say is you have Jesus and you have the church. Well, wives are expected to fulfill the role of the church. They're supposed to reflect the role of the church. And we see this in verse 22 through 24. It says, For wives, this means to submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. And the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Now, can we all just agree for a minute that that's a little uncomfortable in this day and age? Some of you are like, yeah, it's easy for you to say, put a man up on stage and tell all the women in the room they're supposed to submit to the men in their lives. It, it's important to understand what this verse means and what is it saying and how it can bring a lot of joy and peace and happiness into your relationships. Number one, I just want you to know this isn't saying that uh, husbands, your, your wives are like doormats, Right? Wives, this is not, that, that's not what this submission is talking about, but what, what is it talking about? What does it mean to allow your husband to be the head of your relationship, for you to submit to his leadership? Let me first say this, before I even explain this. What we're about to read, I hope it makes it really crystal clear for those ladies in the room that aren't married yet, that you want to have a godly marriage. It is so incredibly important to marry a godly man. It is so incredibly important for you to marry a godly man. Because some of you in this room, you're, you're thinking, I, I'm already married and I'm not married to a godly man. So when I read a verse that says the husband is the head and that I'm supposed to submit to his leadership, like what does that mean? Well, I get it. It's a very confusing concept because when Paul wrote this, he was writing to believers. He makes that really clear in the first part of chapter 1. He's writing to a husband who believes and a wife who believes. And he's talking to, assuming that, that in marriage you have two believing people. So if you're in a marriage right now where you don't have a, a husband who's a follower of Jesus, 
You still ought to honor him and give him opportunities to lead you in your family. As, but, but understanding there's a line at which you always submit first and foremost to God's word. If you have a husband who's leading you away from the truth of God's word, you always want to default to what God says is best for you. One of the easiest things you can do if you have a husband who is not a follower of Jesus, who's not leading your family and your marriage spiritually, is simply to pray for him. Pray that God would call him and, and help him to fulfill the role that he's been called to play within your marriage. Now, some of you are in a marriage where your husband is a follower of Jesus, but for whatever reason, he doesn't understand the significance of that role, and he's not leading your family He's not leading your marriage spiritually. You feel like you're the one making all the shots. You're like sitting there wanting a husband who can, can guide and, and direct and all that stuff. Here's what I would say to you. I would say see in your husband what he can't yet see for himself. Give him opportunities to lead. Take major decisions to him and say, listen, I want to talk through this with you, but I need you to lead us. I need you to make a decision. I need you to guide our family. Let me say this again. If you have a problem with anything I just said, I don't really feel like you have a problem with me. I feel like you have a problem with God's word. I know it's hard. And some people interpret scripture differently than other people, but I'm telling you, this is what this means. Is that in a godly marriage, wives are going to play and reflect the role of the church in the relationship between the church and Jesus. Okay? Let's look at number two. The mystery of marriage is that husbands are called to reflect the role of Jesus. Don't miss the significance of that. Husbands in a marriage are called to play the part of Christ. I remember 21 years ago, my wife and I were at the altar. We were saying our vows and exchanging our vows, and Pastor Bo, who was our pastor at the time, he was standing there, and he had words to kind of exhort us and then challenge us and encourage us. And what he said, and at first I didn't understand what he was saying, he said, Matt, you will never really fill the shoes that you're meant to fill in this marriage. These shoes that you're supposed to, I'm like, my shoes are fine, Pastor Bo. Like, I, I, I tried them on at, you know, the tuxedo rental place. They're he's like, no, you're never going to fit the shoes. And he explained, you are called to fulfill the role of Christ in, in this, you're to reflect Christ in the way that you love your wife. The way that the church is supposed to submit to Christ, the, the, the role that the wife has, you're supposed to love your wife the way Jesus loves his church. I'm like, listen, guys, you're never going to be able to pull it off. None of us in this room are going to be able to love another person perfectly the way God loves people. But we're called to be imitators of God, to give it our best shot, to try really hard. And so I made a list. Well, let me read first the, the Ephesians 5, 25. It says, for husbands, this means to love your wives just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. And so I made a list. How is it that God loves his church? If, if husbands, you're supposed to fulfill the role of Jesus to reflect his role in the way he loves the church, how, how does Jesus love the church? And if Jesus does something for the church, then husbands, you're called to do this for your wives. The first thing I think that Jesus does for his church is he provides for her. He makes sure that if there's a situation where his wife is in need or this family is, is in need, that there's some sort of role that is not being fulfilled, the husband is going to make sure that the, his wife is provided for because God makes sure his church is provided for. Another thing I wrote down is God definitely protects his church. The Bible's really clear that, that even hell is not going to be able to overcome the church. So if we know that God loves the church so much that he's going to protect it, husbands, you are called to protect your wives, to love them that way, to protect them. How about this? We know that God longs to guide his church, 
to give his church direction and to, to help it where it's supposed to go and to, to shine a light on the, the right path. Husbands, you are called to guide and lead your wife. How about this one? This one's pretty simple. I know that right now, God is in this room. He is here with us. He loves you so much that he sent Jesus to the cross so that you had an opportunity to put your faith in him and that by putting your faith in Jesus, you one day can spend eternity with God. Do you know what that means? God wants to spend time with you. Husbands, one of the ways you can love your wife is simply by spending time with her, cherishing her, making sure that she knows how special she is to you because that's the way God loves his church. These are some bitty, really big shoes to fill. How about this one? We know that God loves the church so much he was willing to sacrifice his life for her. Husbands, there probably won't be a moment in your life where you have to put yourself in a place where you have to say, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice my life to protect my wife. I hope that if that opportunity ever shows up, that you will love her enough to do that. But the sacrifice that you'll probably experience, it's more of a daily sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that when you pull into the driveway at the end of a day and you're sitting there thinking, you know what, I've worked really hard, I'm really tired, and you know, the one thing that I want right now is to go inside and just give myself a treat and be alone and just take some time for me for a minute. It's that daily decision to say, or... I can choose to make sure I go to bed exhausted tonight because I've sacrificed for my family. I've sacrificed for my wife. When I'm exhausted and I don't want to do anything else, Jesus gave his life for the church. At least I can go in and say, hey, what can I do to help? We know that Jesus leads the church and helps the church grow. Husbands, this is the same is true of us. We're called to lead. Now here we are on Father's Day. I want you to know that all these same things are true, dads, for the way you're called to love your family, your children. Now I'm not just saying protect your wife, protect your kids. Provide for them, guide them, cherish them, spend time with them, sacrifice for them, lead them, help them grow. Dads, what are you doing right now to guide your, your children spiritually? Are you, are you the one in your home that's making sure that they have a, a healthy meal every day from the Word of God? Are you ensuring that they're learning how to operate as lights in this world? Are you the one discipling them? The Bible says that you husbands are called to fulfill the role of Jesus in the way he loves the church and your family. It says in verse 27, it says, and he did this to present her. You know, Jesus did this to the church to present the church to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. It goes on to say, husbands, you should care about your wives and your family the same way you care about yourself. If you want to provide for yourself, you should want to provide for them. If you want to feed yourself, you want to make sure they're fed. If you want to protect yourself, make sure they're protected. Why does it say this, though? I, I still don't know if we've got to the heart of the mystery of marriage. Paul's talking about this mystery, and I don't know if we've quite gotten there yet. So I, I want you to understand that the reason why a, a husband it says, should love his wife as if he's showing love to himself. It's because one of the mysteries of marriage is that the two, a husband and wife, become one flesh in marriage. That when you provide for your wife, when you protect her, when you cherish her, you actually are providing for protecting and cherishing yourself. You become one flesh, according to Scripture. It says that the two are united into one. I think a better understanding of this word, according to Scripture, is that the two in marriage are actually reunited into one. Let me explain what I mean by reunited into one. You see, back in the garden, 
God created everything, right? He, he was sitting there before there was a garden. He created something, said it was good. He created something else. And he says it's good. He created something else, and he says it's good. He kept creating things and calling it good, and then he created Adam out of the dust of the ground, and he looked at what he made, and it was the first time in all the creation account that he looked at what he made and said, it is not good. Right? He looks at Adam, and he says, it is not good for man to be alone. So he put Adam to sleep, and out of the side of Adam, he pulled out a rib. And from that rib, according to Scripture, he fashioned together Eve, woman. And then with this passage that, we've been, that, that Paul's quoting, it actually goes all the way back to the, to the book of Genesis. And he says, at some point, the two, remember you have Adam, who's missing a rib, and Eve, who's made out of a rib. The two will be reunited back into one flesh. It's a really powerful understanding. Here's this, the third mystery of marriage. Marriage was designed by God to unify one man and one woman for life. I think one of the things we have to understand in this mystery of marriage is that marriage was invented by God. You don't get to take someone else's invention and, and change it and call it the same thing. You've got to give it a new name. Like the world wants to take the concept of marriage and put a whole bunch of new policies and rules in place, fine. Just don't call it marriage. Because God invented marriage. And marriage has a very clear definition all the way back to the beginning. Adam and Eve, one man, one woman, together for life. That's it. Sorry if I'm stepping on your toes. I'm going to step on some more. Here we go. All right? Notice in God's creation account that he created one man and one woman, two genders. And notice also, that God invented marriage and therefore gets to set the rules. Think about this illustration. You have a man missing a rib and a rib, right? A woman made from a rib. You can't reunite a ribless man and a ribless man back into reunite them into one flesh. You can't. You can't take two ribs and unite them back into one flesh. You can't. You can take a man who's missing a rib and a rib and reunite them back into one flesh. This is the way God designed marriage. One man, one woman for life. Ephesians 5, we keep reading, verse 31, says, As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. So why is this so mysterious? And what we see is in verse 32, he calls this a mystery. He says, this is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of, of the way Christ and the church are one. It's an illustration of the way Christ and the church. So we have this marriage concept that he invented, and he says, I invented marriage to illustrate the way Christ and the church operate. That's what we've been talking about, right? Have you ever noticed that married couples, the longer that they are married, the more they start to look alike? I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because the wives at some point start dressing the husband and they're like matchy-matchy or something. Or they start using the same words, the same mannerisms. Their hands do the same thing when they're talking. And before you know it, they're like, they're like twins. Like what happened? Well, we, we notice it, but I want you to understand that there is something powerfully, mysteriously supernatural about marriage. We understand naturally, right? You take one man and one woman, they are united into one flesh through the intimate act of, of sexual intercourse, and you have this natural thing, but there's something powerfully supernatural that happens in marriage. That's the mystery. When Paul's saying it's, it's a great mystery how two can become one, I'll tell you the mystery. If someone came up, you went into math class, uh, you know, it's summertime, so no math class, right? If you go into math class and the teacher says one plus one equals one, you're going to scratch your head and say, well, that's a mystery. That doesn't make any sense. That, that's odd. 
And what Paul is saying here is it's a great mystery. Somehow, supernaturally, two individual, natural kind of beings become one flesh supernaturally. I I wrote this about my wife. Um, You know, my wife is a reader. She's an enjoyer of coffee. She is a roller coaster hater. She is super pretty. I am none of those things. Like, I can make a list of the things that my wife and I have that are not in common. Like, she is her individual person. I am an individual person. It's not like you just become married, and then you both start liking dark chocolate. I still hate it. I don't get it. Like, like we still naturally were two unique people. But there's something powerfully, mysteriously supernatural about marriage when it says the two become one. And so this leads us to our fourth point. Number four is that God designed marriage to reflect his oneness with the church. God designed marriage to reflect his oneness with the church. Let me explain what that means, but first I want to put a quote up on the screen. I want you to think about this for a second, all right? Marriage is not designed for your happiness, but for your holiness. If you're in this room right now and you're struggling in your marriage, maybe you plan to get married one day, I want you to write this down. I want you to remember it. Marriage is not designed to make you happy. It's designed to reflect the relationship that God has with his church, which is a, it's a, it's a relationship that, that's meant to bring holiness. It's meant to be an a, a incredible thing, but it's not designed for your happiness. Listen, if you went into marriage and you were standing up on the altar and you're thinking, you know what, I'm so happy today and this marriage, it's meant to make me happy. Listen, I've been married 21 years. I will tell you, my wife will tell you even more than I will, there are days where you're not going to be that happy. And if as soon as you're not happy, you're thinking, you know what? I didn't sign up for this. I signed up for marriage because I thought it was going to bring happiness to my life. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to use your get out of marriage free card that the world hands out and just end it. But the truth is, think about this for a second. How does God love his church? You know, at one point I gave my life to Jesus. I stood up on an altar, not really, right? Use the wedding analogy for a moment. And I gave my vows and I said, God, I want to make you the Lord of my life. That was a vow I made. God, you know what that vow means? God, I'm going to do everything the way you want. And do you know what I did probably like hours after making that commitment? I, I, like all you, right? don't look at me like I'm some weirdo, right? Every day, we make decisions, we, we think things, we say things, and we're like, God, I know I promised that I was going to do things your way, but I'm already cheating on you, and instead I'm doing things my way. And if God, every time we said, listen, you made a promise to me that you were going to do things my way, but now you're doing things your way, Matt, again, I'm done with you, you're out, I want a divorce. But that's not the way God loves us. God loves us the way we're called to to reflect this marriage relationship within our marriage. We're called to love each other like that. Marriage is not designed for your happiness, but for your holiness. Don't get me wrong, by the way. I have a really happy marriage. If you do it right, you're going to find that most of your days, you look back and say, wow, what an incredibly happy marriage. But your marriage will end real quickly if you think it's always meant to make you happy. You see, God has reunited believers to himself through Jesus. God loves the church so much, he sent Jesus to the cross to sacrifice his life. That those who simply put their faith in him now have access back into a restored relationship with God. That's the way he loves the church. That's what marriage is supposed to look like. You know, my, my wife, Melissa, she is my fiercest supporter. What I mean by that is if you mess with me, I want you to understand, you've messed with her. If you mess with her, you've messed with me. She's my ride or die. If you want to see me act not very pastoral, (laughs) 
You mess with my wife or my kids. That's how you pull it out of me. That's the way Jesus loves you. That's the kind of support he has for you. That's the way he wants to protect you. That's the way he wants to provide for you. That's how God feels about you. So we always end with this prayer. Um, and I want to pray this prayer with you. It goes, it's simply, what now, God? You'll see it on the screen. Um, and this what now, God prayer is where we ask you in a moment of, of just reflection, asking God, God, what do you want me to do with this information? And so I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and we're going to pray this together today. And as I pray, if you're in the room and you're on our Ecuador team, uh, you can come and join me on stage. All right, let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we can open it and know that it always will guide us to truth. It is truth. God, we thank you that as we ask this question, what now? What do you want us to do with this, God? We ask right now that you would give everybody in this room something very tangible, something clear that they're meant to do with this information that you would open our eyes to maybe a change we need to make in our relationship. Uh, uh, maybe we have an expectation that needs to be adjusted. Maybe we're not leading our, our wife or our, our children the way we're supposed to. Maybe we're not letting our, our husband lead the way he's supposed to. Maybe, I don't know what it is, but I just pray that you would show us what it is you want us to do with this information. God, we love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.